we're going to get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Bryant Baker. I am the Conservation Director at Los Padres Forest Watch. Thank you all for being here today. This is a really exciting event. We've been looking forward to this for quite some time. In fact, ever since our esteemed guest, Craig Carey, uh, his book came out, uh, his most recent iteration of his book, uh, the second edition, we, we've been really excited. We've been wanting to, to host him. I don't know if you know this about Craig. He actually is a forest, forest Watch alum. He used to work with Forest Watch. I, I don't know if you always put that on your resume, Craig, but yeah. we, we always do. We always, we always like, you know, we used, we used to have Craig Carey. Cool. <laughs> you lie. April 2013 to September 2014. It's on my wow, resume. Remember the, remember the months. Look at that. Oh, yeah. That's impressive. We will be testing your 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 memory skills throughout this throughout this event. So bring it. I I, I accept those terms. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, so yeah, again, thank thank you all for for joining us. We are excited to have you all here. Hopefully, um, well, let me you know let me just start real quick by just in case you're unfamiliar with Forest Watch, which I'm guessing most of you are, I certainly recognize a lot of names. So I know you're familiar with Forest Watch, but yeah, Los Padres Forest Watch, we've been around since 2004. We are a nonprofit conservation organization based in Santa Barbara. Uh, we work to protect the Los Padres National Forest, the Carrizo Plain National Monument, and some other public lands up and down the central coast of California. So uh, we are big fans of the Los Padres National Forest, as you might imagine. And I think Craig, I don't know. I think you've been there a couple times to the Los Padres. I drove by once. Yeah. One. Okay. That's right. I, I think I, I was in the airport. That counts, right? The airport. Right. Yes. The, the big airport in Los Padres, as right. we all that know, one. exists. Yeah. That one. So we, <laughs> we, we, we do share a, I think a love for the Los Padres. I will say Craig has been, he's been stomping around in it for a lot longer than most people that I know, certainly longer than myself. And we are just really thrilled to have you. I, I want to just maybe introduce you to <laughs> probably not, not the full extent of what you deserve here in terms of uh, actions, but uh, Craig, gosh, what, what to say about him. He is a, a lifelong 805, 805er, as he says. So he's, he's been in the area for a long time. I think what you're, you're based in Ventura. Is that, is that correct? correct. Right. And you have been going to the Los Padres. You've been hiking, backpacking since you were a kid. In fact, he showed me a photo a minute ago, which I think we're going to get to see again, where he's just a, a really, a really young, very, very blonde uh, young kid out in the Three snow. Three apples high, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's amazing. And he had this huge beard at the age of six. <laughs> it was just so impressive. I, I could not believe it. So <laughs> we... <laughs> I, I miss I, that beard. I miss the impressive yeah, I, beard. I, I I know it was it went down to your went down to your feet back then. It was really cool. So he he's been going to the Los Padres for a long time. He is a, a scout leader locally. He takes his uh, scout troop out into the Los Padres to do a lot of volunteer work on the trails. So there are probably if you've been hiking on the trails, especially in uh, especially in Ventura County. He, there's a good chance you have been on a trail that he has worked on at some point in his life that his scouts have worked on at some point in, in recent years. So you can thank him. You can thank Craig. You can thank uh, his, his scouts. Maybe next time you see a, a tree that has been you know, fell <laughs> over the, the trail, but has been cut up and moved, moved to the side. So you could walk through a little, little easier. Uh, and well, you know what? What else, Craig? What else do you want me to, to say about no, that's, you? That's, you that's more than sufficient. Yeah, he's um, an author. Yeah, he's an author. You've got oh, you've got a. I know you've got a bachelor's in in history from UC uh, UCSB. Go Gauchos! So a historian, yes. basically. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm a, yeah. I'm a history teacher for the public schools here in the that's Ventura right. Unified. Um, most recently, Ventura High School. Um, it, so yeah, it amazes me. You have a you have a a day job in addition to all two of the things jobs. that you do yeah. two, two <laughs> got put food on the table. Right. Well, I, I know, <laughs> I know. Uh, and so it, it always just, it, it, it amazes me how much, how much you get done. And I see you, I see on social media, all the, all the work you're doing out there and the Los Padres It's always fun to, to watch, to watch that. And of course you have authored this book. I mean, this is what brings us here tonight. I have the first edition. Ooh. It's, it's going to be backwards. This is this is getting vintage, and I just want you guys to see this. I did you say vintage? <laughs> yeah, this is vintage. And look at that. That is go. a this signature. Is shiny. Look at this. Ooh. I don't even think. Okay, I'll tell you a little secret. 
Craig, he signed this without even knowing that I was going to one day possess it. I think he just signed a bunch of copies at Forest Watch and I. When yeah, I, I wouldn't have signed it if I'd known you were going to get it. So. Well, of course. No. Yeah. yeah. And it, yeah. Um, it certainly wouldn't have said happy, happy trails. Happy trails. A lot of is what it do. says in there. Yeah. So we are going to find out tonight why this 10 year old book, why, why should I, uh, if I own this, the first edition, why should I get the second edition? What has changed? Those kind of things. So I think without, further ado i'm just going to hand it over to you craig craig's gonna okay. he's going to show us some slides show us some photos um, including the the one where he has a very long beard as a as a young child i i for for um safety oh, reasons i have photoshopped a lot of the photos of me with a beard i don't want to make any right. other children in the audience feel inadequate okay so, okay uh, they're all you very certainly, certainly make me feel a little inadequate here well i can't help that okay um <laughs> yeah <laughs> So uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you right. for, for being here. We really appreciate sure. it. And then after you get done with the slides, we're just going to go into a Q&A session. Oh, one, one thing real quick before you get started. I'm going to put in the chat, hopefully you guys are all looking at the chat, that is a link to Craig's book. I do want you to give your full and undivided attention to Craig, but if you just, while he's talking, you want to go and maybe go ahead and purchase that book before other people do, because we will run out of them tonight, probably. Uh, go ahead and go snag that, and I will make sure to plug this again at the end. Craig is, I think, a little more hesitant about plugging his own his own book to sell. We are trying to sell his book. We want as many people to have them as possible, uh, have it because it is such a great book. And if you have questions, please submit them via the chat, and I will be compiling them. Uh, you can also submit them through the Q. We have a Q and A sort. Of, there's a, there's a kind of an official way to submit questions, so you should see that on your end as a, an attendee. Feel free to send it either through the chat or the Q and A uh, the Q and A mode, and I will compile those and I'll be asking Craig those later. So, without further ado, here's Craig Carey. Uh, thank you again for being here. Thank you, kind sir. Um, yeah, and and anybody who is uh, needs to click on some links or send some chats. Bear in mind, I am a public school teacher, so I'm used to people uh, tinkering on their laptops, computers, phones, uh, whilst I speak and try to deliver content. So uh, this is nothing new, right? Um, so so this evening, and I and I had chatted with Bryant um, a few times in the in the build up to this conversation. We agreed, or mostly I decided, and he was down with it. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what the Los Padres means. And I don't mean that in like the literal sense, literally, you know, Los Padres means the fathers, but um, kind of the Los Padres means different things to different people. And as Brian alluded, I grew up um, wandering the the Los Padres backcountry. Um, so it means a lot to me and, and on a lot of different levels. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And that kind of segues into the, the genesis of, of why the book. And then I guess afterward, we'll talk about why the new edition of the book. Um, so for me, at the beginning, the Los Padres was basically a big, um, you know, two, nearly two million acre playground, right? Um, I made the I made the quip earlier about the two jobs got to put food on the table. One, um, nobody writes a trail guide um, to make Harry Potter level sales or money, just for the record. Um, and and you know my folks worked hard; they put food on the table, but we didn't have a ton of money growing up as kids. Um, and if you've attended one of my other chats, you've probably heard me mention before I didn't go to Disneyland until like I was in college. Right, that just wasn't on the table. We didn't. That wasn't our weekend shtick right um we would get we would fill up uh the old bronco which you see here in the foreground and this is back before really any of the roads had gates and mom and dad would throw the three boys and a couple dogs and maybe grandma in the back you know um six people in a uh, four person vehicle and we would go and it was great um some of my best memories are tooling around uh, various backcountry areas uh with my folks i would follow my mom through all sorts of places um, to remote sites where she would just pick around and, you know, we'd sit on rocks and eat sandwiches together. And it was, it was chill before we used chill in that regard, right? Just hanging out with your folks and your big brothers, learning how to fish. Um, and, and I know this is going to sound strange, but it was just kind of a given that this was all here. Right. And for me, it was, I had access um, to a lot of places as a kid, because we had a rig that could get a lot of places, right? And it wasn't until I had this whole thing with helicopters that I really kind of started to feel some ownership about the Los Padres. And I know that sounds weird from the from the 
when I say that originally, but when Apocalypse Now, the film came out, I was a little kid and I and just bear with me for a moment here, but my brothers who are considerably older than I were on their way to see the movie. And I just knew that was the movie that had the helicopters on the TV commercial. And man, I wanted to go so bad helicopters. Right. And big brothers being big brothers who are like, yeah, no, we're not taking you, you know? And uh, so like all little baby brothers do, I appealed to mom by I'm, I'm sure throwing a fit. And she said, there is no way a six year old is going to go see that film. So you're staying home and middle brother being how middle siblings are said some, you know, sarcastic, snarky comment, like, Oh, you got to read the book first. Ha ha ha. As they got in the truck and took off. So I was like heartbroken. My brothers wouldn't take me to see this helicopter movie. Right. Cause when you're six, you think that's what this apocalypse now is all about. And my grandma in her uh, inimitable wisdom, or maybe not even knowing how wise she was, um, took my brother's uh, <laughs> snarky comment to heart, went upstairs to the bookshelf and actually pulled off uh, Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness, on which Apocalypse Now is based, and handed it to me. Um, I guess she knew what was in it, and um, any of the things that were inappropriate were way beyond my head, and Grandma said, read it. So I sat down and started reading it. Almost all the book meant nothing to me. But later, I read it again a couple years later, and I found this passage that hit me. And you'll forgive me. I know one of the rules of presenting is never read a quote, but I'm going to read this one, if you'll just forgive me this one time. And it, it talked about the main protagonist. And it said, when Marla was a young child, he would spend hours staring at the blank spaces on maps. And when he found one that particularly interested him, he would exclaim, when I grow up, I want to go there. And I was like, oh, this guy, this Marlowe guy and I, we're like simpatico. This is exactly how I look at these trips. And my dad was a cartographer with this awesome collection of maps. And that kind of emboldened me to, you know what, I'm going to spend more time in dad's map cabinet and start finding these places that aren't labeled on the maps. We call them, you know, the things that are fallen off the maps. And my older brothers, they still do this, would find these bananas excursions, places that, you know, no trail goes, but especially my oldest brother, you catch him just daydreaming while we're hiking. He'd be like, I wonder if we could get to the top of that, or I wonder if we could get to that ridge. And uh, Mighty Mary, if you're here today, uh, you know how it is. He's still doing it, you know, 50 odd years later, right? So I followed my brother around many, most of my teen years. Then I went off to college, met my college sweetie, got married. We move east. We come back from Brooklyn years later. And um, my buddies and I are finding that there's all these differences to the forest. So I start keeping notes like, oh, okay, well, uh, we have to park in a different spot here, or this trail no longer exists, or this campsite is really run down, or, oh, they've improved this trail that was awful when I was a kid, things like that. And then as I start having a family, I start taking my daughter's Girl Scout troop on trips, all the while kind of recording how things have changed. And then as my boy's growing up, I start taking his Cub Scouts on trips sharing with them the places that I'd seen as a boy and as a, as a scout growing up, but constantly kind of keeping track of the changes. And I end up with this ridiculous, you know, jammed up binder clip, sticky noted uh, spiral notebook of all these changes. And as we're enjoying these public lands, I'm realizing, man, not a whole lot of maintenance. I haven't seen a ranger out here in like three years who's doing all this work. Um, so I get in touch with a couple of different volunteer crews. Um, I'm, I'm particularly fond of this photo because in this photo, I'm a um, mid thirties, something volunteer surrounded by a bunch of 70 year old guys. And they're like, Craig, when you, when you're doing crosscut Sawyer work, it's not about muscle. It's about finesse and technique. And of course, you know, being Craig, I'm like, no, watch this. I'm gonna show you what power is. We're going to do this and I'm going to blow your mind as we go through these fire hardened oak trees with these, you know, 19th century tools. By the end of that day, removing trees out on the Agua Blanca and the Cespi, I could barely move. And the 70 year olds are like, oh, that was a great day. And Spryly, you know, walking off to the next campground, eating Fritos, drinking wine like it was a party. And uh, since then, yes, I have learned it's about technique and finesse. And I'm still working on that. Um, and then I started getting my littles. Um, into volunteer work because kind of like my moment of ownership was that aha when grandma handed me that book. I figured little sweat equity for them, right? Uh, put them to work so they feel some ownership of the uh, of their public, not ownership, but uh, well, maybe ownership 
responsibility of their public lands and contribute something. I also found out that if you give a four-year-old a pitchfork, he will do anything you ask. Um, in retrospect, probably a bad move, but he was exceedingly productive um, with that pitchfork on that trip. And then as the kids get bigger, the projects get more ambitious. They start learning more tools. They see other parts of the forest they probably would never see otherwise. I loved that with my Girl Scouts, the Ojai Ranger District had a, what we, what we jokingly, but it's a joke because like the best jokes, it's funny because it's true, was the last forest going ranger. You see on the far right there, Heidi Anderson, um, since transferred up to BLM lands in Ojai. But that woman was such a fantastic example for my Girl Scouts, you know, to have that representation in the field of, for lack of a better term, a badass who could do so much, knew so much, was so strong, so knowledgeable, so compassionate, and what a great example, right, to have for my Girl Scouts to, to get involved in public lands. Miss her every day. And then one day I realized, man, I have changed maps. I have updated this. Oh, there you go, Bryant. There's your um, some of your, your, gu your guides, your native trees and your old Gagnon books. That's, I'm going to open my bidding with, with some of those. Um, that I was really, you know, it was time to get an update out there. And I figured I'm not the, uh, the best writer by any stretch of the imagination. And I don't know the forest perhaps as well as a lot of others, but I think maybe the, the combination of the two, I might be the right guy to, to pitch this book. And after several years of putting it all together and um, some back and forth with the publishers, Masha, the Uber Hoond and I um, celebrated the release of, of the first guide. Um, now, in the process of writing that book, I was reminded of some of my favorite places. And earlier in the week, uh, Lauren had asked me to share some of those. So I'm going to share some of my favorite trips with you all um, with the cons with a caveat that they are um, a little Ojai slash Ventura centric only because I'm on the south end of, of the line. But uh, happy to chat about the Santa Barbara specific areas as well. One, of course, is Reyes Peak and Pine Mountain. Um, majority of which is part of the Sespe Wilderness now for which, uh, or of the trails is part of the Sespe Wilderness now for which I'm grateful. Um, but there are, there's really two routes here of note. The first, if you see in the top right of the screen is that little yellow route, you know, barely a mile of, of walking. And that is the actual trail to Reyes Peak, which is a former lookout site. Now the red line goes out to Haydock and back um, from Pine Mountain and it's actually the one that's called the Reyes Peak Trail. So note, the Reyes Peak Trail does not go to Reyes Peak. Just telling you that now. Um, and it's this great kind of pseudo, uh, you know, it's part of the transverse range, but it feels very Sierra. You know, you're, you're at 7,000 feet. You got these huge conifers. Um, uh, it, it burned in the Matillaha fire in 32, which at the time was the largest conflagration in recorded state history. We can get into fire history in a whole nother conversation um but just a great stretch of forest um and i know brian you and i had talked about how uh among the public lands blm and and national forest lands are great if you have a dog because they're they're welcome there as long as you are a responsible dog owner whereas like at national parks it's so prohibitive it's just it's almost not fair to bring a dog on a trip to a national park um and one of the things i love about going up to reyes peak is that it was the site of one of the original fire lookouts. And I'm not really a, a, a peak bagger or a guy who likes to, you know, claim different uh, high points in the forest. Um, I enjoy visiting all the mountaintops, but it's not really like, I don't have a life list or I don't join the Sierra clubs trips when they do that kind of thing. I just like to visit them at my own pace, which is admittedly slower than average. And, um, um, on my own time. And uh, the Reyes Peak Lookout was built in 1927. And irony of ironies, it was actually made of local sugar pine timber, which of course, when the fire does show up, that makes it pretty susceptible to the very thing it's supposed to detect, right? So it only stood for uh, five years. Uh, here's a photo of it under construction on the left and uh, Ranger Green and his lovely bride um, sometime before the Matillaha fire and uh, the, the story goes that um, the marine layer was so thick that by the time they spotted the smoke and saw the fire coming, it was basically on them. And um, the ranger and his cohorts were lucky to escape with their lives, let alone any possessions. Um, and the remains now still demand pretty 
um, great views and there's still some of the, the superstructure or the, the foundation and the, the footprint of the, of the lookout. And um, I want you to bear in mind that if you ever visit this with a dog, like dog years, they get seven times the credit. So if you take a dog and they go five times, they have 35 dog peak bags. All right. So please, please do give the, the dogs the credit, do them. Um, parts of the roof are still there nearly a hundred years later. You get great views looking out into the Kiyama watershed. It's just a fantastic short trip. It, it, if you're, if you have sea level lungs, like I do, uh, if you arrive and start hiking immediately, you'll, you'll feel it. Um, just like you would feel it at Mount Pinos. Um, it, but it's it's a great short trip and it's a great way to get kids especially uh out and just exploring right even if they're not interested in the history of it there's so much to see in such a short little stretch um another one of my favorites happens yes to also be a lookout site and this one is still intact this is the thorn point lookout also in the sespe wilderness but accessed from the north side of pine mountain um the lookout was built in 1934. In the foreground of this photo, you see the aircraft warning service cabin um, built in the early 40s um, when all the lookouts were pressed into service as aircraft lookouts um, during the Second World War when they were expecting along the Pacific coast, you know, to have the, the, the Japanese airplanes come over, you know, the Channel Islands at any moment. They kept these lookouts staffed 24 7. So the cabin was where. The ranger off duty would reside while you spent a eight or 12 hour shift up in Thorn Point Lookout. And in a minute, I'll show you some of the views from that. Um, and this trip is, is uh, actually short and it's uh, deceptively steep. Uh, you start at Thorn Meadows Campground, which I think will soon just be Thorn Meadows Trailhead. Um, and you start at 5,000 feet and you end at nearly 7,000 feet. In three and a half miles, you know, 2,000 feet, yeah, that's steep, but not not, not doable. Um, the real rub is that in the first mile, you gain about a hundred feet. So you're like, wow, this looks like a really steep trail. You're hiking along the first mile. You're like, man, this is like, this is like a super highway. This is great. You know, what's all the, what's all the, this trail was steep about. And then it's the second or the, the second and third miles is where you, uh, really get the quad and lung busting going on. Um, and it's a southward bent to Thorn Point. Great ferns, even right after uh, the fires that went through there, they rebounded quickly. Uh, cedar trees, great views of the geology that define this part of not only the forest, but of this Pine Mountain Ridge specifically. Uh, you see here actually on a forest watch service project that I led back in September of 2013. Um, on the left is a photo of the, the uh, the lookout in its current condition. And on the right is a photo of uh, the lookout in December, 1940. Um, so about a year before Pearl Harbor and before it was pressed into duty. Uh, you can see there in the, in the left kind of background, there's no cabin. Uh, views from the lookout, uh, looking out toward the, the west, looking down. One of the issues with the staircase here is that the, the stairs don't have any risers when you access it. So if you're short-legged like my dogs, it's very disconcerting. So getting dogs up here is nearly impossible. So we just let them rest downstairs. This doesn't always work, but I have a short video clip. So if you, uh, if you have a fear of heights, this may not be your thing. Or if you get motion sickness, like when you watched Blair Witch, um, it's a little jumpy. So be patient. We'll see if it works. Oh, it does work this time. Fantastic. So this is a quick walk up of the Thorn Point Tower. Watch me try to navigate it with this GoPro on my head like I know what I'm doing. But you can see right away you're at 7,000 feet and there are, there's, there's virtually nothing obstructing your view aside from my attempt to get up the stairs. And when you get up there, you will see, yeah, it uh, definitely looks like it was built in the thirties and last maintained, oh, maybe in the thirties, you know, last real work it got was in the seventies, but the views are gobsmacking. You can see usually seven of the eight channel islands when there's, when the marine layer is burned off. You can see Sawmill, Mount Pinos, the backside of uh, Nordoff Ridge there. And as I walk around testing it, because I am a little heavier than your average backpacker, making sure I don't fall through the floorboards in a Scooby-Doo moment, looking out toward Mutaw Flat and uh, Cobblestone Mountain and the five, just fantastic views. 
and absolutely worth the uh, <laughs> worth the uh, exertion. Now, also on the high elevation, I do like my high elevation destinations because there are some of the few places you can go in the summer and not get absolutely cooked. Um, those of you who frequent the backcountry will know that um, the Los Padres gets hot in the summer. And as a general rule, I try to avoid backpacking um, the lower elevations between oh, Memorial Day and Labor Day. If I'm going to go in the summer, I'm going to go for the high elevation. Um, Dr. Walker, if you are here this evening, I thank you in advance once again for the million, millionth time for what is likely my most favorite picture from the Los Padres. This one that you see that he took um, from a trip we did a few years ago to sheep camp. Um, from the top of the Chula Vista parking lot, we head west along the top of Mount Pinos, Sawmill Mountain, and then into the saddle just east of Grouse Mountain. And then we drop down the North Fork Trail into Sheep Camp, which at 8,221 feet, I think, is the highest um, trail camp in the Los Padres. It starts on an old service road that back in the day when I didn't have permission to borrow mom's car, I drove her 1963 Rambler up this road. We don't need to talk about that right now, thanks. Um, but it's also a fantastic place to train scouts in public service and in navigation because unlike the Montecito Santa Barbara front country or the Ojai front country, if you go off trail, it's not a bloodletting of Manzanita and other unforgiving chaparral. Here, if you go off trail, you're just walking around a tree and it's very open terrain. Um, it's got a lot of springs. It's a very popular place with the dogs. I just threw this photo in one more time because I love it so much. Um, water is good almost all the time. Uh, you do need to check the spring box should a rat or a squirrel have gotten in and drowned. It's happened more than once. Um, and beautiful camps. And the takeoff point is this underappreciated gem of the Chula Vista parking lot where the Nordic ski base is, um, which is just a, a great spot. It's a great little walk-in camp. Um, we use it a lot with the Boy Scouts to, and the Girl Scouts previously um, as kind of an introduction to camping and high elevation camping and how to secure your, your food against you know, bears and other critters and, and all those best practices when you're camping. Um, it's also a great playground in the winter if you're into snowshoeing, cross-country skiing, um, or snowball fighting. Um, can make for a pretty cold and uh, challenging camp as well, but nothing uh, builds character like uh, cold toes. Um, and I think what is the last of my favorites is the Gene Marshall Page Blanca National Recreation Trail. I usually do this as a shuttle. Most people do this as a one-nighter. But again, um, I'm an ox, not a gazelle. So I typically do it in two nights. Um, and I like to do it like any good um, ant from the forest. I like to travel south because it always feels like I'm going downhill. So I will start at Reyes Creek in the north and head on a southeast tack toward Upper Reyes and Bear Trap. And one of the great things about this, uh, this route if you are a tree dork, like um, our host this evening, thank you, Bryant, um, every one of these trail camps ha has or features spectacular specimens, or the first one, two, three, four, five trail camps feature spectacular specimens of incense cedars, like just, just great, great examples. And we go second night for me to Pine Mountain Lodge and then the toe busting uh, descent down uh, into Piedra Blanca back to the Piedra Blanca trailhead, which for you older hats is the former Lion campground, now just a parking area. Um, it too is part of the Sespe Wilderness and we head up the backside of Pine Mountain through some great unbroken pinion stands to the first saddle where um, some people have no dignity and do great dances um, into the first trail camp at three miles, which is Upper Reyes, um, again with the cedar trees um, there happened to be a, a pretty robust population of uh, jays up there, which drive the dogs mad to no end. And then it's another up and over into Bear Trap Campsite. So named because in the late 1800s, the Reyes family, for which many places in this part of the forest are named, uh, trapped some of the last grizzlies native to this region. Um, 
you see here where Mr. Jackson's unpacking his bag, the girth on that incense cedar. Uh, Bryant and I both agree, likely pre-Columbian, just a gorgeous monster tree that I've spent uh, many a night under and many a meal and many a fire and many a laugh with a lot of friends. Uh, from there, it often gets pretty brushy, a lot of alder, a lot of gooseberry, a lot of uh, bear activity, um, some great geology uh, to the saddle where the headwaters of the Piedra Blanca and Bear Trap Creek split. And then it's this... Uh, Undulating. I think uh, I've been accused more than once of understating the seesaw effect as one goes from that saddle to the next camp. I say something like, oh, you know, it goes up and over dale kind of thing. And it's, it's, uh, it's a climb and then it's a drop and it's another climb and it's a drop. So I won't pretend it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not some effort. Uh, but then you reach another camp um, with enough cedars to uh, outfit an entire troop of hammockers. And Pine Mountain Lodge was also was so named because of the cabin that was there in the late 1800s into the 1900s, um, built and maintained and regularly visited by an outdoor group called the Sisquak Rangers, which I think is a great name. Um, let me get a little light here, sorry. And, um, and um, one of their members was Earl Stanley Gardner, whom uh, some of you will know as the creator of Perry Mason. Uh, and he was a Ventura resident for a time and a, an avid outdoorsman. And then there's the toe jam, toe jamming or toe crushing or spirit crushing, whatever you want to call it, if it's hot, uh, descent for three miles down the uh, south facing slope of Pine Mountain to the first Piedra Spring and across uh, the creeks into the Pedro Blanca formation, which is just a fantastic stretch of geology and really a great place to take scouts or kids or anybody interested in just some, some great unstructured free time, which I think we can all agree um, our kids are short on these days and um, just taking, up to this, taking them up to this rock formation with their best friends, four-legged or two, um, is a great, uh, again, just a great playground. Um, so those are my, my top three hits there, Brian that I uh, wanted to share. So I will stop, stop from uh, projecting there and uh, give it back to you. Awesome. Well, that was, that was great. I, I tried to go as fast as I could. Sorry. No, that was, that was good. And there, I, I, I wasn't getting any like time delay. So that was good. Sometimes we have that. Oh, so okay. um, yeah, those photos are awesome. I, I'm really amazed with your Photoshop skills on getting that beard out when you were a kid, though. That right, was, thank you. That was I impressive. Yeah, you in advance. And, and there was a photo in there too where it was the shortest I've ever seen your beard. Um, it was one of those. It was early on. I there I might have been really a impressed. fire involved there. Um, right. Yeah, when we so teach fire skills, the no match fire. Yeah. Um, more than once, I've uh, gotten a little too you close to the embers. Got, got a little singe. Yeah. Yeah. Always, always Guilty as charged. I, I have that that problem as well. Quite. Oh yeah, you seem to have it really bad. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's the reason I, yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, thank you. That was, that was really cool. I'm sure a lot of people have, have questions. We, uh, we're already getting some in our Q and A and again, folks, uh, please put your questions in the, the chat or the Q and A section. And I do want to say for those of you not with us live tonight, uh, you, maybe you're watching from YouTube, maybe you're watching on our website. Uh, just so you know, if you look down or up. I'm not really sure where it's going to show up. Depending on where you are, there will be a link to the book, uh, to, to Craig Carey's book, which is called Hiking and Backpacking in Santa Barbara and Ventura. Should I hold that up since you have the old one here? Hold, hold it up. Oh, look, it's not even flipped. That's great. So that is the book. You will see a link somewhere in the description of this video. You will find a link to our website that uh, is a place where you can actually purchase it. And part of the proceeds actually do go to supporting the, the work that Forest Watch does. So please, please buy the book. And again, I'm going to put it in the chat here. And real quick, I just, can we talk about the incense cedars just for a second? I, I, oh, I'm wondering if I, I, I just have to, I have to, I have to do this. Hold, hold on one second. Um, uh oh. Let's see here. Okay, so do do I have you beat on on girthy no cedars here? Okay, no, one I'm nobody still... has me beat on girth. Second, <laughs> no, I think that tree. Um, I don't know. It, it, there might be a scale thing here. How tall is the hiker shown here? She's nine feet tall. 
<laughs> so um, I was going to say my, my, uh, my scale model was six foot five and a half tree battle. That's right. Uh, um, no, I, she, I don't know. That, that, that looks gonna... like, uh, that looked like Cedar Creek. <laughs> it is. Yeah. You yeah. know, you know, your Cedar, well, cedar destinations. The, yeah. Well, it's got a little char on it too. Is that yeah, that's from the day fire. Guilty burn, burn, burn the day fire. Yeah. Which yeah. is that tree is amazing though. I just, I, I have so many photos of that one particular tree, but I love, I love the one that's up a little further. That's like the big or a little further down, I guess the granary the granary, tree. the big granary tree. Oh, yeah. Man. I know that one. I've got some great, some great photos of that as well. Yeah. Okay. So we, we don't have to keep nerding so. out about, right. about trees. I just, when you showed that picture, I, I had to see if, if, I don't know, we'll, we'll have our tree battle. Uh, let's tune take a, in let's next take a week. tape measure. And let's yeah. let's measure next time. Tune in uh, Instagram Live. We are going to go out there and we're going to take a DBH measure, a diameter at breast height, and we will uh, we will we'll figure it out and we'll, we'll we'll battle. It'll it'll be a tree battle. People are asking for it. In the it chat. won't be a battle. It'll be a slaughter. I already won. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, I know some. I know some <laughs> big. I'm, I'm going to eat those words. Spurs. How about that? This. Yeah. I'm sorry. What um, was that? Yeah. I know some big big cone Douglas spurs. So oh. maybe. You, We'll, awesome. we'll, we'll have to decide on the species, decide on the place, and uh, yeah, tree battle. So okay. let's get into some of these questions, though. I do. Let me see here. I was writing down. So one one thing I wanted to note was that it's really cool that your inspiration for becoming an author was Heart of Darkness. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, yeah, not intentionally, I'm sure, but you know, <laughs> I'm mostly kidding. But uh, I just when you when you first started bringing up apocalypse now i was wondering if that was where it was going and i was i was very curious like oh wow that's it's an interesting entering interesting inspiration but uh, that, that was really cool uh, a really a really nice story there and uh, i learned some other things about you know like giving kids pitchforks and things like that so we oh can, yeah we can get into that if we want but uh i guess let me while i'm sort of compiling some of these questions that are coming in from the audience i wanted to just ask you uh, one, one thing geographically. So most of what you showed in terms of your favorite places were in, I believe all in Ventura County. Is uh, that, yeah. So let's think about that. So what, what's your favorite, you know, if you were going to put another one on that list, but it had to be from Santa Barbara County, what, what would you, what would you say? Oh, Mission Pine for sure. Especially if you're a humble Lily, uh, dork, um, I'm, like I'm a big, William be, Humboldt yeah. Guy um, fan. yeah. yeah sure. Um, um, if you go up to um, Kachuma Saddle, um, where the old guard station used to be, um, and you, you have to follow the road, the, the service road that, that cuts uh, east from there several miles through Hell's Half Acre and McKinley Spring to reach McKinley Mountain and then get to the San Raf Wilderness um, boundary. But so, you know, if, if, if you're one of those people who doesn't care for road walking, dirt road walking for a few miles, it may not be your cup of tea. But once you get past that, um, Mission Pine Ridge is great because you get to Mission Pine Spring, you get to Mission Pine Basin, you get to hit San Raf Mountain. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty partial to the high elevation spots. Um, I also, um, you know, for, for some of the like, if you're trying to get people interested in backpacking, you don't want to take those long drives and those long trips. Um, and I'm, I'm a big fan of Forbush Camp, which is like a mile and a half off the north slope, off of the Camino Cielo, down the San Ynez, along the Mono Trail. A mile and a half also has cedar trees, but it's also got olive trees and um, pears from back in the early 19 aughts and 1910s when a homesteader named Fred Forbush, after whom the uh, the camp is named, uh, had a couple orchards that he planted there. And uh, a lot of those trees still bear fruit. Um, it's got uh, not reliable water in the summer, but in the spring and fall, you tend to have pretty good water. And it's a nice, quiet little spot. Um, and it's a good introduction to backpacking. Um, Th those spot. pears really threw me for a loop the first time I came across. Yeah, they are. They're not very tasty. I'll be honest. Yeah, uh, I I would not recommend it either. So you, you mentioned, you mentioned mission, mission pine. Uh, can you, what, what's, what's the round trip on that? I forget the, the length. Um, if you take that route you were talking about, is that, I mean, it's like, that's a, that's well, a pretty it, lengthy it, hike, right? Yeah. It depends on how far out you go. Um, because you can go all the way to the big pine buckhorn road, which ends up being 20 something miles. But, um, you know, you do it as a, you can do it as a, as a two nighter. Um, I think from, just short of San Raf, it's uh, about eight miles. So I'd say 
I'd have to look, but maybe 15 round trip. I'd have to look okay. that up. That's not, that's not as bad as I was thinking. Yeah. So yeah, that's cool. That's, no, no, uh, not round trip, 15. Th- okay. Because I was thinking it was 30-ish. Yeah, sorry. Miles yeah, round 15, trip. 15, yeah. 15 15-ish out, 13 or 15. Okay. So there's a lot of not a lot of numbers to contend with, right? And a lot of good, a lot of cool trees up there. Uh, yeah. Of course, it's it's main mission pine for for a reason. Right. The 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 story goes that that is where they sourced the pines for the beams and the timbers for the Santa Barbara mission, hence right. the name. Um, yeah. Uh, so we are okay. So I guess one thing I want to ask you about is about this second edition. So I've when I, when I first moved here, your, your first edition was a very big help to me getting out on the trails. Great. And one of the things I loved about it was that you didn't just talk about the trails themselves, but you talked about, you know, how to get to the trail, where are you going to park those kind of things. That's not always in trail guides. And I, I, I just, and that say, changes. Yeah. yeah. And, and it does. And so I, and that's kind of what my question is, is what, you know, what led you to want to do a second edition? What were some of the big substantive changes that you, you thought, okay, these are really important and I need to do a new edition of the book. Uh, can you maybe just go through that process? Yeah. The, um, yeah. Yeah. If I, if like on the flyer off the top of my head, I would say it's kind of a, maybe a three stage thing. One, um, there's a general rule. And, and some of you have heard this before. I think there's a general rule in like travel or nonfiction publishing to where if 10% of a guide is subject to change, either price changes, access changes, websites have changed, or any logistics have changed, it's time to update the book. Um, So there was a point where Wilderness said, hey, are we at that point? And I said, you know what, I think we are. Um, And I hadn't really been um, quantifying, you know, the percentage of, of need, but yeah. And kind of that's one, and then like one, or that's one A and one B was I started the revisions in a very optimistic time where, um, you know, the Franklin trail had just been recut up and over and, you know, access, um, to Matillaha falls, uh, thanks in large part to forest watch was now available to the public and, um, Montecito hot springs was back in the public domain. And there were all these things to add to the book. And I was so stoked. I was like, Oh, this is great. So while I'm, you know, while I'm getting ready to add new content and, and, you know, um, with some discretion, remove some, some roots that maybe shouldn't be in there any longer or are no longer practical, um, kind of do a swap, new content, updated content kind of thing. I was, I was so excited for all these new things. And while I'm doing it, it's like, all right, well, these, the prices of these campgrounds have also changed and, um, where they want you to park now for say Horn Canyon has changed right now. Thatcher wants you outside the school, no longer on campus grounds and, you know, legitimate, tweaks like that. Um, and I was about halfway through and I'd hiked you know, 30, 35, rehiked 30 or 35 of the trails. And um, I was taking a weekend off from the recon part of it. And I was leading my boys on a, on a service project in the San Raf wilderness in a, in a section that the book doesn't cover. Um, because um, despite my efforts to make it a two volume set because I wanted to cover more of the forest uh, wilderness is like, whoa, this book is already way oversized. Like it's bigger than we wanted it to be. <laughs> so yeah, no, no, had love to... for, no, no, no love for slow County or, or Monterey. Uh, huh? uh, not yet. Um, <laughs> I'm working on that. Right. They oh, do okay. have the, you know, Heidi. Or, or, yeah. Yeah. Um, Annalise Wright, Reed yeah. Wright has uh, the big Sur guide. Um, so I, we were doing a service project, repairing some, some, uh, signs that the bears had torn up in the San Rafael wilderness. And we were hiking out on December 2nd, 2017. I was like, this is great. I'll get home. I'll keep working on the book. Um, and as we're driving and getting back into cell reception, my wife says, Hey, um, heat's really bad. Wind is really bad. Um, we're on a red flag warning, blah, blah, blah. I said, all right, you know, maybe I won't go out this, this, this weekend again, cause it's so hot. And that night the Thomas fire started like right down the road from us. And then it was a matter of watching that just take over our attention in December and seeing friends lose houses and, you know, then come January and the mudslide comes through and I'm not really, I'm not thinking about the book at all. Right. And then when I might, when things kind of settle down and, and um, I kind of refocus on the book and there's a deadline coming, 
so much now has changed. It's like, I can't document the Montecito front country because there really isn't one, right? I mean, Romero Canyon was just, the trail was effectively scoured from, from the canyon in, in a lot of sections. So I, I got what I, you know, I hated to ask, but it was necessary. I've said right now the forest is closed and a disproportionate section of this book's coverage is not accessible and it needs a, a pretty lengthy and detailed reassessment. Um, so that, that um that kind of put a pin in the balloon of of how excited i was to to do the book um but then there's i think there's something cathartic in walking a lot of that the you know the montecito trails foundation and and other volunteer groups like the lpfa the work you go out and do bryant with with the forest watch volunteers a lot of work got done and then that was heartening to to see a lot of people roll up their sleeves who might otherwise not have felt the investment to go out and do that right um, so there was a bit of a delay in getting it done. And then that changes a lot of the language. I can't say for, you know, all the Montecito, Santa Barbara front countries, I can't have like a long description of how it's different from the Thomas fire. I had to change it and just in passing mention the Thomas fire. And then they also, the new rule in the style guide is don't mention a fire that's more than five years old. So I had to remove most references unless it's in a real legit, um, historical context, like the Matillaha fire of 32, the day fire of 06, the Saka fire of 07. Um, I had to pull out of so many fire references um, that the Thomas fire is, is a, um, it's definitely the, the, uh, the, the specter or the shadow that kind of hangs over a lot of the book as a result. So, um, and then, and then, you know, there, there were minor changes to access. Sisar Canyon has a gate in front of it now. So you have to park differently. Uh, again, Horn Canyon's different. Uh, there's, there's, uh, I think it was 72 hours. So three days after the book went to print, they finally opened the, um, uh, they finally opened the, the uh, potholes trailhead up above Lake Piru that we'd been waiting for, for 12, 15 years. And we just kind of figured that's yeah, it's never going to happen. Of course it happens right after the book goes to print. And now they're painting lines out on, out on, you know, the 192. So you have to park in different places if you want to access cold spring and you're, you're an overflow parker. So uh, the moment a book uh, goes into print, the moment it goes into print, it's out of date, right? Cause it's, it's static and things change. Yeah. I was a part of the committee that, that made sure that all the changes went in right after you published. I, just, I appreciate that. Now I know yeah, who to just, go after. We wanted a third edition quicker. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> No, um, you know, I think it, it reflects just how we are humans. We always think we're at the end of time and we forget that time is going to continue and things are going to keep changing. And it's hard for us to, to remember. Uh, I'm not saying it's hard for you to remember this. I, I'm saying it's just things change. The landscape is always changing. Yeah. Uh, you know, for, for as static as the topography is, things change and our access to dynamic. it is, yeah. is flux. Yeah. Yeah. Especially yeah. with fires. Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, there are places in the Thomas fire, you can go out and you may not quite realize that it, it had burned just a few years ago. Same with the Zaka fire. Uh, I think most people who maybe have gone up to the hurricane deck would, would not realize a fire came through not that long ago, you know, in the grand scheme yeah. of things. So it, it's, it's one of those things. It's, it's hard to capture that in a book. And that's why we're so glad that you are able to do a second edition and hopefully one day, a third edition and a fourth edition. If my legs will let me do it. Yeah, exactly. And so, my wife. Love you, babe. Right. <laughs> so um, when she's holding up your cue cards, right? Oh, yes. I, I can't you read that fast. You behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can't so, read it. I can't read or even think as fast as this mouth talks, which is uh, why I get in trouble at home sometimes. Yeah, I was going to say, that's it's a, it's, a, it's a dangerous combination. So one, one question somebody had was about old campsites, right? We look at these, uh, a lot of maps that still have you know, particularly wilderness camps, I would say, you know, you go, you go out to one of these places, you, you, you make, all, you make your way. And for the life of me, I cannot find the, the little icebox stove. I can't find any sort of semblance of a, of a camp. And, you know, you look long enough, maybe you find something. Can you just talk a little bit about maybe why some camps aren't where they used to be? Just, just give your kind of view of, that sort of state of flux in terms I, of- I, I must admit that question, um, that line of questioning in, in a reference to historical maps, I could probably count on one hand who 
the, the, the four or five guys and or gals who probably asked that, but I'll, I'll venture that guess later. Um, yeah, well, first, um, public lands don't get the funding they used to. Congress, uh, you know, the, the Los Padres doesn't have the resources or the, or the fiscal teeth, as it were, um, to maintain a lot of um, the sites that it used to have. And in the, uh, the federal fiscal crunch of the mid 70s, um, the Ojai district uh, especially was disproportionately impacted by that. So there were a lot of sites that um, were you know, technically removed, but that just means, you know, no longer included on the maps that's removed from inventory does not mean somebody actually hiked out there and disassembled tables and removed ice can stoves and removed any other accoutrements of a, of a campsite. Um, so th th there's that, that some of the, uh, the things that are more prone to survive the passage of time, ice can stoves or concrete, um, uh, footings of either tables or stoves or, or you know, uh, cooking stoves, those will survive, but they'll be overgrown. And as we know, um, a lot of things can be lost to plant growth in this forest, especially. Um, things are hard to spot if, if uh, the manzanita or other brush um, grows much higher. Um, so so we've, we've ended up having to um, kind of channel a lot, well, an increased number of users into fewer number of campsites. So the campsites that we do see, we're used to these big, worn out, beat up, graffitied, you know, illegal fire rings all around campsites because they're beyond capacity. Whereas some of these guerrilla sites, if you know where they are, are obviously preferable because they're quiet. They're off, literally off the, you know, the beaten path now. Um, and, and, I, and I really think that, you know, with what I feel has been this groundswell of um, volunteerism in recent years, say decade, um, I think there's some hope for some of those camps to be reclaimed. You know, we've seen um, trails reclaimed, um, like the Franklin Trail. Um, and my hope is that um, part of the, you know, what, what you would call the campsite or trail camp infrastructure can be reclaimed. Um, there's places, um, you know, in the Cespi and the Agua Blanca, um, watersheds especially where there's and and out on the San Amigdio Mesa you know there's dozens of camps that you can name quickly that are no longer on the maps but a lot of them are still actually there some of them still have tables and they're just not on the inventory so that was kind of a circuitous answer I apologize but um and, yeah. you, and you met gorilla with a ue not an o correct that's right I'm the, I'm usually the biggest primate out there thank you yes yes I, we, you know, it's so funny. I actually, um, I got, I came across when I first started working. So just again, Craig used to work with, you used to work at Forest Watch, uh, before I, before I came on. And when I first came on, I was just going through some old files on, on the computer I was given. And I found some photos of you and it was for some, it was clearly for some sort of social media sort of joke post about Sasquatch and, and you were the Sasquatch. <laughs> in my, yeah. Um, in my, uh, red, uh, great Pacific yes. Ironworks ball cap. And um, I was standing at table four on the um, uh, Kennedy Ridge Camino Cielo trail, pointing oh. to the Matillaha Overlook. I will try to find that photo before the end of this if I can. Oh, no need. Thank you. Um, oh, no, no, no. It's, it's perfectly <laughs> fine. Uh, it's no, no trouble. No trouble. But uh, boy, that really started the, the, the kind of myth mythos of, of Craig Carey in my brain. I, I just was. And now that you meet me, it's all a disappointment. I apologize. I, I, I well, mm, well we, <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. Don't. don't oh, okay. Good. All right. The so, night is young. <laughs> um, you know, somebody did ask, this is a really easy question uh, that it, it, they, they were asking about that meadow. Uh, it's the Chula Vista meadow. Someone was asking to repeat the name of that camp. It's, it's oh, Chula, yeah. Chula, Chula Vista, Chula Vista yeah. like the community above San Diego. So when I tell, I often tell scout parents, well, you know, the boys will be camped at Chula Vista this weekend. And they're like, oh, San Diego's a long drive. No, it's a different Chula Vista. Yeah. Right. So it's where the road, it's where the Mount Pinos road ends there at the Nordic ski base. And it's just northeast of there. It's about a, you know, two or 300 yard walk uh, to this yeah, really nice good. campsite. It's a great little campground. You can't, you can't exactly park right where you're going to sleep. Right. You, you got to walk in walk a little in. ways. 
yeah it's yeah. but it's not it's not a bad walk and and that meadow right there it's a, it's a one of our examples of kind of a high elevation wet meadow and right now actually it was just there a few days ago um there there are just a ton of western blue flag it's a, our native iris uh, they're all blooming missouriensis or whatever yeah yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Yes, it's um, it's got Missouri in the in the species name, the species epithet. Yeah, which is a little confusing. But there's also a lot of corn lilies. It's one of the only places where corn lilies grow native, or they're native, and it's one of the only places they grow naturally in the Los Padres. So, I do recommend getting up to that meadow if you can. It's it's a it's a cool place. Um, this you know kind of brings me to a, another question about campgrounds, about trailheads. So you you probably noticed this as you obviously I've been working over the last decade, um, you know, on, on, on these, on these editions of the book, but what, what would you say? Somebody asked a question about, you know, parking passes, um, you know, fees, things like that. So, I mean, can you just maybe give us just a a very brief overview of uh, that kind of hits that, that it's complicated. (laughs) It is. It's it's complicated, but here, here's some general rules. Um, Maybe like the, the three basics. One, if you're going to park on the side of the road, make sure your driver's side tires are off the road enough that you're not on the fog line, which is that white line on the far right of your road. Two, um, Adventure Pass isn't as contentious as it used to be. It's like zero enforced, but I didn't say that. Um, And really the general rule for the the need for an Adventure Pass is if there is a restroom provided or there is some sort of infrastructure there there's some sort of services provided then you're supposed to have it so page of Lanka trailhead um sections of no oh, it used to be sections of pine mountain it's not anymore it's, it's really um, mostly in the, the mount the mount pinos ranger district is yeah it is it, and and you need it yeah and you need it in the winter if you're um, up at the top of mount pinos for you know what they call winter snow play but you don't need it in the summer to park there yeah it's um, unusual yeah, so it's kind of weird. So you may my also general need chains and yeah, uh, but you need to go prepared. For sure. Yeah, yeah, um, and then so there's there's that, and then otherwise um, you don't really need the adventure pass uh, for ninety percent of your visits. The real trick is just paying attention to the the signs and any overnight parking restrictions, and um, really making sure you don't leave valuables in in your vehicle. Um, it, though it's gotten a lot better than it used to be. Um, break-ins are not unheard of at the Cold Spring Trailhead, Matillaha Trailhead, and the Sespe Trailhead. Um, in fact, I think I just read something today that uh, somebody somebody's car got broken into at the uh, uh, Upper Oso Trailhead, uh, the well, or River Preserve, yeah, um, which yeah, a lot of people it, use to access Kennedy Ridge and um, uh, the Ocean View Trail. So, right. yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that is something that I'm always... I, I, I've had my car broken into one time at, at a trail. It was at Piedra Blanca and it was, it was like on a Tuesday afternoon or something. I was just there scouting something with an intern and a, and a coworker of mine. And the craziest thing, I mean, there were, we, we had a laptop in the car, you know, we had a backpack and what they stole was a makeup bag. I mean, in, in, in the, you know, it was just very strange. Hmm. It's like, how did you miss the laptop? Yeah. Um, so yeah. Well, priorities. I, yeah. <laughs> priorities are weird yeah i don't know uh yeah it's always it's, interesting but broken see. windows are a bummer you know well yeah and 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 they're they're just very frustrating <laughs> they're very frustrating especially if they're like like i have a forerunner and you know if it's that weird little window there's these weird little side windows that are just they have the they have the antenna in them and they're just hard to replace so yep um so yeah people are asking some kind of general questions like what would you say, it, you know, in terms of what would be like an easy, uh, like a simple backpacking trip, uh, but for someone who's not really in the best of shape, but wants to have a little backpacking experience? Story of my life. So I'll get to that. One thing I forgot, to, one thing I forgot to mention was um, um, cont- or along with the um, Adventure Pass conversation. If you have a America the Beautiful um, Federal Lands Pass, which is a little red card that you get and it gives you, you know, unlimited use or access to uh, national parks in one calendar year, that can double as your um, Adventure Pass. So if you've already got the America the Beautiful Federal Lands Pass, do not buy an Adventure Pass. You can just leave that card on your dashboard. It's an $80 investment, but if you visit national parks frequently, 
totally worth it. That said, um, a lot of places to visit. Um, a lot of places, there's a lot of places to visit if you're just getting into backpacking. So both from like a fitness concern, or if you're not super comfortable going into the deep, deep wilderness yet. Um, for those of you based in the Santa Barbara area, I'm a big fan of 19 Oaks, not so much in the summer, like most places in the summer. Um, but if you go to the lower San Ynez rec area, drive out to the, um, Oso campground, um, it's a short walk up, uh, along the, um, service road. And then it splits out to a single track and 19 Oaks is nice. It was recently rebuilt, um, post, was it the white fire, the Whittier fire, one of many fires post one uh, of the fires. Yeah, there was the white fire and the Ray fire were out there. Yeah, oh, and the Ray fire. Yeah. I and, um, yeah. I think it was troop, uh, 26 in Santa Barbara or Galita, um, recently rebuilt uh, a lot of that camp. Um, so that's a nice short hike in again, four bush, uh, sorry. Yeah. Four bush flat is a really nice short hike in. Um, and then if you're down in my neck of the woods, um, it's Potrero John is uh, one and a half miles. It's uh, along the 33 right across from the, uh, the real famous Sespe climbing wall. And then if you, uh, you know, don't mind the crowds and if you maybe don't go in the summer, you've got a lot of options along the Sespe river, which is, um, is a very popular spot. So uh, spring break, avoid it. Holiday weekends, I tend to avoid it. Um, but if you just want to go on a quiet fall or even early winter weekend, um, when there's when there's plenty of water in the creek, um, it's all along an old road bed. So it never gets very steep. It's impossible to get, wait, I shouldn't say impossible to get lost because somebody might take that as a challenge. Um, it's easy to navigate. How's that? Um, and, uh, you know, in the, in the fall and winter and spring water is extremely reliable. Um, there's a spot 4.5 miles out. So if you don't pack overly heavy, um, um, even in the summer, that's a, uh, a good spot with water. It's called Bear Creek. It's a, uh, it used to be a car camp as did most of the camps along that route. Um, there was a time, as late as the late seventies that you could drive, uh, the old Sespe trail. It was the Sespe river road. Um, and that's a really sweet spot and a, and a great swim hole as well. If that's your thing. What would you, I mean, this is maybe getting into some more of the basics of hiking, backpacking, camping, but you know, what kind of, what kind of gear do you usually take? You know, I, I guess maybe talk a little bit about what are the things that you want to know before, before you go, how do you want to be prepared? Uh, like, I'm just thinking, you know, you mentioned Sespe river trail and I, I know a lot of people who have tried to do that in the dead heat of late summer and it's tough. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it's tough, even though it's a relatively flat trail, it's just very exposed. It's very hot. So maybe could you talk a little bit about what to, what to think about before you're getting out there and doing this type of work, uh, and, and getting out, you know, on the trail and what kind of gear that, you know, you, you feel like you can't go without. All right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's, uh, first off is you can't go without having done your homework. You know, there's a, there's a, um, what's the, it, it's kind of cliche. It's so common, uh, know before you go, right. Uh, you have to know before you go read up, you know, visit hike Um, it's, it's, a uh, kind of an open source user sourced uh, website that's uh, run by the LPFA. And it's got, um, it usually gives, gives you water updates, trail conditions, any, you know, is there a, is there a new hornet's nest in the camp? Is there a tree down on your way? Good, good intel like that. Um, do you, do your homework and, you know, take your, in, in scouts and in general, we talk about taking your 10 essentials. Um, but also if you're, getting into backpacking, odds are you probably know somebody who's already into backpacking, right? And I'm a big believer in the buddy system um, and it, not just your dog, but if you've got friends who backpack already, pick their brains a little bit, right? Ideally, you're gonna go with somebody who's already been to a lot of these places. It's one thing to pick a new route, but if you're new to the, to the backpacking and backcountry navigation game, um, that's that that can be a pretty steep learning curve um so ideally if you've got a friend who knows or you've got a place you can get some skills um um leverage that and and the same goes with uh your gear you know there's the 10 essentials right you got to have your shelter and your first aid kit and your sunscreen and your um headlamp i can't the number of trips that go south because somebody didn't bring a headlamp and they're an hour or two behind schedule and they get lost on the way back in the dark 
are too numerous to count. Um, but like any other gear, maps and compasses as well um, are super critical, but all of those are useless if you don't know how to use them. So the number one tool is your brain and that brain has to be populated with some intel. You've got to not only make smart decisions, such as leave a plan with your loved ones at home, um, let them know where you're going to be. Um, the, the general rule at my house is I say, babe, this is where I'm going to be. And this is, um, what I'm taking with me, any meds I'm on, who's with me, what their age, medical condition. I probably go a little overboard, but I leave it with my beloved. And I also leave it with my brother who is, uh, um, a member of the local search and rescue team. And the joke amongst my boy scouts is he'll come for all my scouts, but he'll probably leave me there. Right. But I tell the boys, unless like you absolutely need to, do not push that red button on my inreach because I will never live it down if my brother has to come get me. Right. So I make double sure I am packed and I got my gear ready to go. <laughs> um, um, you know, do, do your homework, know before you go and take your essentials. And there's no reason to not take your headlamp. There's no reason to not have enough water. There's no reason to not have a pocket knife or enough calories to get you. You know, I take twice the calories I need. And that's a lot because I eat a lot of calories. But don't be don't be too proud to perish out there. So ah, if, if, DNR. Yeah. <laughs> Do not rescue. No. Okay. Maybe, okay. Craig, Craig's on a little bit of a different level. <laughs> Sorry. But, tangent. In, my bad. Um, <laughs> no. Yeah. And it's, and you know, just you, you have to be smart when you go in because you, and, and you know what, do not rely, rely on cell service. Um, the number of people who go into the wilderness thinking, I'll just call somebody if I need help. When I read that, I'm just, no, there's, especially if you have at and I'm telling you now, Verizon, but you Verizon people don't get cocky. Verizon is way better in the backcountry than AT&T. Um, don't at trust, least don't, tr- don't trust that though completely. No, no, I mean, don't. Just assume you will not have cell service. Yeah, exactly. You're, you're I, out I, of- I got cell service at Cedar Creek Camp or, uh, yeah. I think there are some weird it. places it, where it it'll, catch, very it'll catch a whiff. It, it yeah, usually no it's sense. at the high points. Yeah. yeah. So, so you're, you know, pack your essentials, know what your 10 essentials are, leave a plan with somebody responsible. And um, if you've got a friend who knows the area, leverage that expertise, ideally have them go with you. Yeah. I think the buddy system is, is really good. It's key. Uh, especially yeah. if you're just, if you're just starting out for sure. Uh, what about water? You know, someone asked about, do you, do you carry a water filter? Do you yeah. just, do you just drink straight out of the stream? Well, what are you doing? No, there's <laughs> a couple places where I would high elevation backcountry, not trammeled by man, the kind of places, but, Look, the SESPI is some pretty dirty water because you think of the number of vehicles that and bridges that go over that. Um, and, you know, the, the joke back in the day when we were kids is we called Giardia beaver fever, right? Because who knows what creature is peeing into the water upstream. Um, so, yeah, I, I do filter my water as a precaution, but also because any of my water, if I let some of my scouts use it, I can't have them get sick, right? Because then that's that's poor leadership on my part. So yeah, I pretty much filter it all. And I like right now I use a, a Sawyer squeeze, just a real simple filter. Um, I've had the mechanical filters with a lot of moving parts and they, they're good, but they are slow and they tend to break down. And um, those, those little UV wands, everyone I've known who's ever used one, the batteries always go out. Like we've never had those and the batteries not go out. It also does nothing for the taste. It doesn't get any of the particulate right. matter out. So I, I do, I like the Sawyer Mini, which I'm guessing yeah. is what you mean by the Sawyer yeah. Squeeze. Those are not expensive. Uh, no, they're great. They're like 20 yeah. bucks for the, and they thread onto a 20 ounce soda bottle they're, or a they're just ginger ale perfect. bottle. They're great. Yeah, they're awesome. So I, and and they're they're supposed to be good for about 100,000 gallons of filtration, right. which is a yeah, lot. So two or three trips for me. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, speaking of how much water, you know, you probably drink, I do have to, uh, guess what I found? I did find this Uh-oh. photo <laughs> yeah, there there is there is the uh um, oh, that's the, great the, what would we call that the cra- the crasquatch um the craig the craig squatch i like it um, yeah so i like it a lot yeah, this is a rare oh rare i missed found that hat. footage yeah that was a great so, hat anyway i just had had to show that i appreciate okay. it good job I, I i knew i had it somewhere so that's good um <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me, uh, let me get back to here to look at, oh, I do want to say Mary Luby, who. Oh, Mighty Mary, what's up? She, she is in here and she's been, she's been chatting in, in the chat. 
uh, with, with us at least, I, but she did just share a, a link or a couple links to all of the attendees as well. So check those out. That's from uh, the Ohio Search and Rescue. Perfect. Um, they've Hopefully got some, they've got some really good. With... Yeah. yeah, I think it's okay. consistent with what you said. Okay, and, and those are good resources for, for, you know, what you need to know before you go. And uh, she also mentioned that uh, like the Sierra Club, they offer their wilderness basics course. Yes. Uh, you know, there, there are backpacking classes out there. REI often has uh, courses for, for those kind of things. So there are ways to actually, you know, if you want to feel like you need to get some training from, from some experts, uh, people like Craig, they, they do, they do have classes out there. Yeah. I, uh, actually, Mary and I both speak at the Sierra Club's Wilderness Basics oh, course great. each year. Um, not last year, of course, but um, each year we, we, we give a little thing. Brian Conant and I often tag team a like, favorite places to go now that you've got these skills this is where to take them kind of thing right so great yeah thanks mary maybe maybe we need to have mary come come on here at some point totally and, she's way more tell engaging. some tell some search and rescue stories uh i'm sure she has a lot especially in places like santa paula canyon there yeah you might always, scare some people away with those yeah yeah oh right okay so that's actually that brings me to another really good question i through through my line of work and through meeting people out on the trails a lot and and and, and getting presentations i i always come across a lot of people who are hesitant to get out into nature, hesitant to get out, especially into the backcountry, they're worried about things like mountain lions, bears, rattlesnakes. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about what you feel like you should or shouldn't be worried about in terms of getting out in nature? And, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, be aware of all those things, but um, I'll be honest, the, the the creature of which I'm most wary when I'm out there is your fellow man, right? We're the least predictable and, and really the most dangerous to ourselves. I've seen a lot of bears. I've seen a few mountain lions. We've seen a lot of snakes. Never had a problem with any of them. Um, um, you know, if, if, if you backpack or hike a lot with a dog, I would recommend a snake uh, avoidance training. Um, different groups, uh, including I think recently the Ohio Valley OPLC. Land Conservancy. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ohio Valley Land Conservancy. They were just offering twice. that. Again. Yeah, I've done it twice and, with them, and it's excellent. and that's great. You know, um, especially if you have a not to quantify it again, but if you have a big dog, you really want them to avoid it because big dogs are hard to carry out. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, it's it's yeah, bears are out there. You know, you're in their turf. Um, so secure your food, hang it, or use a bear canister. Um, don't sleep with, um, you know, your, your, uh, your golden gram cereal box as your pillow kind of thing. Cause then they're, they may come a little too close for comfort. Keep a clean camp. Um, but really, and, and I say this to parents of new scouts and it applies really to anybody who might be a little hesitant to go into the, to the wild, the drive to the trailhead is your most dangerous part of the day driving on the freeway in that 2000 pound 80 mile an hour bullet um, is the most dangerous part of your day. Once you're in the wilderness, you're in pretty good shape. Um, you're on foot and it's, it is, it's, it's really safe. You know, yeah, every once in a while you may come across some person you would later describe as a weirdo, but I've, it's been few and far between. Um, like if um, they came across you on the trail. Person. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and I should <laughs> one, ha ha, very funny Two, And I should qualify that. I know that. Yeah. I probably feel safer than the average person out there. One, because I know it well. And two, look, let's face it. I'm, I'm, um, I'm the stereotypical forest goer, right? I'm a large overconfident white guy. I've even got the, the beard to the point. I, I look like a caricature of a stereotypical forest goer. I, I, I recognize that. Um, so even for the single ladies out there or, or um, people of color who are looking to get out and get their communities out or get their, their families out, it's on the whole, it's a really safe uh, endeavor. And, you know, like my, like my folks uh, showed me early on, the price is right. You know, if you can pay for the fuel and uh, maybe the parking, if you have to, um, it doesn't take a huge investment. You don't have to buy all the fancy pants gear. Um, you know, a pair of trail runners and some and and some smarts are really uh, really all you need to uh, to not just survive out there, but to thrive in the forest. And and again, I think it goes back to just the more homework you can do about where you're going to go before you yeah. go there. It really yeah. really helps. I always recommend looking at, I mean, look at highclosepadres.com 
you know, dot com. Dot com. If, uh, you know, and get yeah. Brian Conant's. Oh, you know what? I've got those handy. Um, there are three, if, if I may, oh, right. um, three maps I would recommend. Yeah. Um, for my background or backyard, uh, Tom Harrison, Sespe Wilderness Map. These are great. They have contour lines. They're waterproof. So um, th those are super handy. Brian Conant, the executive director of the LPFA, has his uh, Matilla and Dick Smith Wilderness Map, which I've gone through so many editions of just beating it to death. And then for those a little further north in Santa Barbara County, the San Rafael Wilderness Map, also by Brian Conant. Um, these three, which I recommend in my book, sorry, that felt like a pitch. Um, these three are the maps. You have these and you've got almost the entire forest covered with the exception of a um, most of the Shumash wilderness, um, which is, it is what it is. There's not that many trails in the, in the Chumash wilderness. No, actually. there's there's four main trails to speak yeah. of. Yeah, and and again, um, you know, um, look over your shoulder when you're hiking, not out of paranoia, but so you know what the trail looks like on the way back. Um, you know, just be smart about your navigation. Um, be smart. Be smart about your time management. Don't expect that you're going to average three miles an hour. Trust me, when I have a gaggle of twenty six little leg Boy Scouts out in the field, we are lucky to do one point eight miles an hour. <laughs> So, uh, when I'm, when I'm looking at plants, I'm, I'm doing 0.8 miles per hour. Exactly. Year. Right. And, and, so. and you know what the, 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 the old adage of take time to stop and smell the roses or in Brian's case, take time to stop and photograph the prickly flocks. Take that time. Okay. Do not make it a race to get somewhere. It's not about your destination. It's so cliche to say it, but time in the forest is, it is about the journey, you know, um, but like Ed Vister said, and we just talked about this earlier, Brian, it's, it's um, you know, returning is mandatory. Summiting is optional. Do plan your trip accordingly so that you just get home safe. You know, I, I tell my boys and previously my Girl Scouts, if we are on our way somewhere and we break down on the side of the road and you guys just hang out and chat for three hours while I figure out what to do, that was a good outing as long as everybody gets home safe and there were no injuries. We were outside which is the goal right now. Kids are so overbooked, so over digitized, so over screen timed. Let's just get them out into the fresh air, even if it's, you know, with a broken down old truck, whatever. And, you know, if you're, if you're wanting to see this sunset from a really pretty spot, you know, high up, you don't, you, you know, one thing I always think about is if you are having to do several mile hike to get to a peak that you want to see the sunset at, remember that that means you're going to be walking back in the dark. Um, and so keep that kind of thing in mind. There are yeah. plenty of places you can just drive and you can park your car and you have an amazing view. Camino Cielo, East Camino, West Camino Cielo around Santa Barbara. Uh, excellent places to go see the, you know, see the sunset and just- Or enjoy. leave the day yeah. ahead and spend the night somewhere exactly. where you're going to- Yeah, that way you can, it, yeah. 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 And that way you know the route. And I do want to say, you mentioned those three maps. We have all three of those maps for sale ah, on our website as well. You so you can get, you can get the, 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 the four pack here. You can get Craig's book. You can get uh, both of Brian's maps and you can get the Tom Harrison map for the Sespe Wilderness. Oh, it's the so, four horsemen of the Los Padres map cop apocalypse. And quite, quite frankly, we've got a lot of other things. We actually, I'm gonna <laughs> Oh, shameless, shameless plugs. I love this. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. You know, I was about to show this, but I'm actually not sure if we have this in stock right now. But this Let's is also the Atlas. Of, it's the yeah. Atlas, yeah. The Atlas is also really pretty cool. Uh, it's, it it's is for the for the slightly nerdier map map folks, I would say. But um, someone did ask you ask you know when you were talking about GPS equipment, did you know is there something that you use? Is there a modern GPS that you like that's not too te technologically sophisticated? Yeah, I use uh, right now. You know, I like the Garmin. GPS series. I have one that's a combined GPS receiver and a two-way messenger messaging. It's it's called the Garmin InReach Explorer. Um, and I should qualify that with, I don't know if I'd have purchased this originally, but when I first started working on the first edition of the book, um, my wife was concerned about her dog um, because I was backpacking with her dog weeks on end. Uh, sometimes just me, which is kind of contrary to my own advice sometimes, but um, not everybody can take as much time off as I needed to get the book done. And so I bought a spot uh, 
Spot Messenger, which was kind of the, the, the in thing at the time. That way, at least she knew her dog was safe. Thanks, babe. Um, and then in recent years, I've, I've become enamored with um, the um, facility of the InReach Explorer, which allows two-way messaging. So if there's a change in plans, I can text it off to my brother or my wife and say, hey, everything's good, but we're going to go down this ravine instead, shorten the trip by a day, or we're going to stay out an extra day. And that way, you know, the hell I don't hear the helicopters at this age. I'm less interested in helicopters showing up on a trip than I used to be. Um, so, um, the inReach Explorer is great. You know, there is a subscription and once you get to a, a certain number of texts or two way messages, I think they charge you like 11 cents a message or something. So bear that in mind. It's not unlimited. Um, that's the one with the subscription, a subscription service too, right? Like, correct. I think you have to pay. Yeah. I, I have yeah. it as well. I have the inReach mini and uh, I do like yeah. it. it it, it connects yeah. to your phone so you can look at all the all there's the an app the yeah apps, there's an app phone. you can get yeah. to to i guess bluetooth sync it with your phone um right. yeah and 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 like the spot if you're in a real pinch um you can um there's you've got some red buttons that i typically um that i typically uh duct tape down and i tell the boys under this duct tape there are some red buttons you know do not push them unless absolutely have to um but knowing me i would accidentally like sit on it and you know butt dial search and rescue or something or the coast guard or whomever so mary, mary uh, you're gonna butt dial mary luby huh mm, no gosh i hope not i would never i would never live that down <laughs> i don't think she'd let you <laughs> it's um, funny because it's true <laughs> <laughs> so uh you mentioned you, you've mentioned kids a couple times you've mentioned uh scouts you know if someone did ask like what is you know your favorite place to really to take kids and engage them in nature. I'm sure you have a lot, but it's a long place list. That, yeah. Yeah. And it probably depends um, on where you are, you know, where you're it does. It depends on, it depends on where, yeah, it does. It depends on where you are. I mean, I like taking kids to the beach and teaching them some local history. Like in Ventura, we have the gun turrets from, um, there were gun emplacements while they waited for the Mitsubishi zeros to fly over the channel islands. Um, and I love taking them there, but in the forest, um, in the spring and when it's not blazing hot, I like to take the scouts to um, the Sespe. Uh, we talk a lot about, um, um, you know, the riparian habitat and we talk about the history of the Sespe and, you know, the, the flood in 69 and whatnot. Um, and, and general safety, we talk about one of, one of the, uh, it's kind of obscure history, unfortunately, but one of the, the topics that's near and dear to my heart was the uh, um, uh, crew, 2925-C, which was a WPA crew made of all African-American uh, WPA teenagers. Um, um, and they were stationed at several places in the Los Padres. They were mostly from the Canoga, what is now the Canoga Park, West Hills area. But they were stationed at Santa Barbara Petrero up on the Sierra Madre Ridge. And they were stationed for quite some time at um, uh, Pedro Blanca. Um, so I like to share that history with them. Um, and then in terms of the natural world you know we talk about uh, native species and the sespe is kind of a, a great spot for you know you talk about the arroyo toad maybe we'll get lucky and we'll see a condor we talk about steelhead trout but then we also talk about all the catfish and nasty fish that are in there now and um i don't know if you're familiar with the book um by brad monsma the sespe wild i share some of those stories with them and um and it's a great place to just have some unstructured like i said earlier free time just to go play uh so if you're in the ventura ojai area Definitely the Sespe. Um, um, the Santa Ynez rec area is great for Santa Barbara folks. Um, but then, you know, so is the upper Santa Ynez area. You get them into a hot spring if they're into that kind of thing. Um, once they eventually open the road to uh, to uh, Upper Caliente and whatnot, it's a lot of, lot of good spots for kids. And, and really all those front country trails, you know, the Cold Spring Trail, Tangerine Falls, you could go on forever. I, I like that you mentioned unstructured time. I mean, that that's so important. We've, that is a big uh, thing for me. Yes. My, my coworker, uh, Graciela Cabello, she's our uh, director of community and youth engagement. And she, um, she always works that into uh, the, the youth hikes that we do. And um, yeah. it's just important to stop at the Creek and let them, let them go play, play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and enjoy it. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, you know, I was just looking, uh, I was just looking at the schedule for our event here and I realized it was supposed to end at eight and it is, I was thinking it was going to be eight 30. So, uh, I, I kept you longer, man. I told you, you put a quarter in this jukebox. You got to let the whole song play. 
Hey, so. man, I've got plenty of quarters too. That's the thing. So, um, well, oh, let's. I, I think it's probably time. You know, we wrap. We wrap up. Uh, there were some other questions. Uh, I, I guess I'll end with yeah, so going back to your. I want to go back to your book because this this is okay. in part to to plug your book. Just as a reminder, I'm putting it in the chat for those of you who are still with us, and um, and if you're watching from you know, watching after the fact on YouTube or on our, our website, check for it in the description, a, a link to where you can purchase Craig's book. But someone asked, you know, in your own words, how would you set it apart from online guides and maps and resources, you know, on the web that people can access for free? Yeah, you know, that that's, that's a really valid question. And, and let me I'm going to preface this with if if we've been getting asked a lot of questions and that we're not answering, I'll apologize in advance that we're not staying until midnight and answering them all. Because you know I love to. We can. Um, I, I'm fine to stay longer. <laughs> by the way, we can keep going. I I mean, there's no there's no harm in. Yeah, we can go for a while. You know, it's a some we got to work in the morning, right? Um, so let me. Um, yeah, you know, it, we're we're at a point now where some people say the 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 book industry is dying, right? which uh, I will never accept. I will go down swinging on that. Um, one, there's something to be said for having a book in hand, right? And I did concede earlier that a book, once it's in print, it is a little out of date, but it's also kind of a snapshot in time. This was as accurate as I could make it when it came out, right? So um, whoever had asked the question about um, about historical maps, that's kind of the same thing. Maps, they're a snapshot in time. Uh, on the assumption they're accurate, right? Um, and not to put myself in a in a on a pedestal above online content, but there is a certain danger in people just you know on Facebook or on some uh, what's the um, on Meetup or or whatever one of those sites where it's just everybody talking. If you take it as gospel, you're you're. Uh, opening yourself up to a little more maybe factor. And um, as much as I'm a big fan of unstructured free time and of being flexible and adaptable once we're in the field, I want to know that the intel I'm working with is accurate. And um, I'm not making any guarantees. And in fact, I'm pretty sure there's some sort of disclaimer at the opening of this book, but I've walked these trails and, um, you know, um, I'm not some 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 kid from Calabasas who's uh, seen it on Google, so he writes about it on a board. Um, um, and and this is uh, a, a book is different. You can carry it with you. You can have it in your backpack. If you lose your batteries, or it rains, and your phone fries, or your Kindle fries, or your Nook, or whatever you were using, yeah, the book will be soggy, and you won't be able to use it for fire starter as much as you may want to. But the book will still be there. So, um, I, I think the book carries a little more weight literally but also figuratively it's it's um a book has a little more authority uh, it goes through more of a vetting process it's not peer reviewed but um boy there are a lot of hands in this <laughs> and there was a lot, a lot of, of feed i think a lot of peers reviewed it though yeah yeah, yeah. um there's some there's a, there's some pretty harsh feedback there's there's a lot of um there's a cross section of forest goers what a friend of mine calls uh, the lpnf fanatics um who were rather upset that I included certain sections of the forest in the book. And I got some pretty uh, scathing emails. How, you know, like, how dare you include my camp there? And I'm like, whoa, buddy, this is a public camp, <laughs> you know, but there's a, there's some real possessive users out there, but they're mad at me. They won't be a problem for you when you're out there. Don't please people don't be possessive of your, of your places. <laughs> public lands, right? Yeah. They're not yeah, yours. They're, uh, they're, they're uh, how's the, how's the phrase go? The land isn't ours. We belong to the land. Right. Right. And I will just to reiterate, one of the things I love about your book is that it isn't just about oh, what happens once you start the hike on the trail, you know, from the trailhead, it's about how to get to the trailhead. It's about parking situations, things like that. And, and it is, for those of you watching, you know, Craig, Craig is an expert. He, he has been doing this for a very long time. He really knows what he's talking about and he's written it down in a, in a way that I think is very accessible to people. Um, so I certainly encourage folks to buy the book uh, and, and 
and we have <laughs> uh, we have some people in here that are that have been chatting with us, and and we're getting we're getting some recommendations to others, you know, that you should buy the book. You know, there are of course some good some good blogs out there, as one of our one of our friends here has mentioned in the chat. Okay, uh, if know. if that's been mentioned, then I'm gonna put I'm gonna put two and two together. I didn't mean to interrupt Bryant, but oh, no, um, I, I'd be willing to bet that any blog mention would be the same as a historical map mention. So, Mr. Lord, if you're out there, I'm saying um, that's that's where I'm putting my money. Yeah, um, a buddy of mine who lives out in the 661, Christopher P. Lord, has a great blog that he's very active on. Um, so, um, yeah, I was gonna, I was going to say I I do think Christopher might be plugging. Uh, Chris, you might be plugging your 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 blog, but it is great. Um, it's great. No, yeah, and, it, and, it's, and yeah, it's it's, it's awesome. relevant and it's and it's current. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the um, kind of the first wave of Los Padres bloggers or whatever, um, uh, which would maybe include me and uh, Jack Elliott and Dave Stillman were not as active. And Chris is part of this uh, really vibrant kind of second wave of bloggers. It's like, and it's, it's like the, re the resurgent, the yeah, resurgence of, it, it, yeah, it, you know, it makes me want to be blog. more active on it, but uh, yeah. I would need a, I'd need 25 or 26 hours and, in the day. And, I think. and Mr. Lord's been going to some, some pretty cool, like lost campsites, you know, going out and yeah. finding some of these pretty. Yeah. Actually yeah. lost in the Los Padres is, uh, is, uh, his, his theme and, and blog title. So. Yeah. I would I say that. it is a double, a double entendre, you know, yes. it's, uh, uh, I don't think he's been lost just yet. Uh, we haven't lost him yet. He's, he's around, he's at least here tonight. So we, we haven't, uh, I'm glad, I'm glad he's, he's been finding his way out of the right on, right on. forest. So, okay. Last question. Then we'll, we'll, oh, we'll end this okay. for real. But I just have to ask, you know, uh, somebody brought up in our Q and a, which other folks can't see, but, uh, but we can see, they, they mentioned like um, the inclusion of this one trail on, on a map, on a quad map. I, I, it was, it was a mystery to them. And it just, it got me thinking, what's like the, the biggest mystery of the Los Padres to you? I mean, what, what is the thing that it just sticks with you and you can't, you can't, you can't stop thinking about it, you know, mystery wise. Maybe it's a weird question. I don't know. No, it is. I love it. Um, uh, and maybe you caught me a little flat footed, but now, honestly, I'm wondering, um, greatest girth of trees in the Los Padres. That's, that's, that's a whole new topic. No. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, there's a lot of, you know, there's like the lost minds of the Los Padres and there's, um, um, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of camps like, and, and, and it's funny because I'm a huge proponent of wilderness. I love the concept of wilderness, uh, you know, a place where man does not remain. Right. And I think the Los Padres is what, like 48% wilderness pre the yeah. next legislation. It's like right at half. And I love that, but I also love and, and, and I'm, I'm reluctant to use the word archaeological because that implies like Shumash, um, you know, things. But I love the old historical campgrounds and I love the historical roots and I love the old lookout towers. And so some of my mysteries are like, is that camp still somewhere out there? And am I just not seeing it because the map is at the wrong scale? And um, there's some historic maps to allude to, again, what I'm assuming was Christopher's query about maps. There's some maps from the 30s, the pre-war maps. There's a lot of camps that um, I still haven't found definitively. And it's it's kind of a, I mean, I guess you could call it a life list um, or a bucket list, but um, that's kind of my mystery. It's, it's less... Uh, I, I think the wild is, this is going to sound corny and I apologize in advance. The wild has a lot of mystery already, but it's, it's a, it's a mystery that doesn't nag at you or make you uncomfortable or make you feel like you need to solve something. Right. I like to just go out like every, uh, for several years, I would go out to the forest and I take a book thinking, Oh, I'm just going to read. Right. But the, your senses are, they're not like overwhelmed, but all your senses are firing when you're out there. Right. So you don't even need a book. You don't need a book to escape. You, you, you're already escaped, right? You're out in the wild. So I think uh, there's that big mystery, but it's not one that I feel the need to solve or probably not even within our purview or ability to solve. Um, and that's one of my greatest takeaways. And the thing that I try to share with, you know, my kids or friends who go, or maybe people who are thinking of going that you can just, there's that peace you can have out there once you're to a certain level of comfort. Um, but then on a personal level, yeah, my mystery would be a lot of the old um, 
campgrounds, trails, structures. There's you know the mines in the Pinos district. Those are just places to find, I guess. Sorry, I'm rambling. I guess one one way to put it, uh, one to add on to that is that there are endless places to explore in the Los Padres. Yeah, National you can explore it your is, whole life, never yeah, see it all. It's, it's it's absolutely massive. Every time I think I've I've been in a lot of it, I realize how little of it I've actually really experienced, yeah. truly. And so, uh, again, it kind of goes back to your book being one that encourage you encourages people to get out there to explore it at their own pace, at their own yeah. level of ability. And, and that's what's so great about it. So again, folks, if you're watching, please do uh, go and, and purchase the book. Um, we are getting, I, I have opened a, a possibly a can of worms here with this mystery question. Um, oh, let me hear what, um, what are people? Well, what we somebody, Oh, it, it's, it's actually my, my coworker, Rebecca August, our director of advocacy. She wanted to know about the, um, the white rock trail, which, you know, over, over in Santa Barbara County, mm -hmm. uh, there are some interesting things on it, particularly there's an old car that you've probably seen way up yeah. the trail. I, I actually yeah. know the answer to this, but I will, I'm going to let you Craig, if you, if you got this one. I don't know the story behind the car. Okay. But I, there's, you know, there's actually, there's a, there's one at the white rock. There's one at the, at the mine there. There's, there's a, a car down at Romero saddle. There's that, I think it's a Studebaker. Cause we always make a Fozzie bear joke. Mm -hmm. um, that one car as you're approaching the Alder Creek flumes off of Lake Jameson. Yeah, there's a lot of, yep. there's a lot of vehicles out there. There are. Yeah. You know, and there's, yeah. And then everybody's got, um, I don't know if they're mysteries or curiosities and there's, there's so many backstories to so many things in the forest right we could go on forever yeah the white the white rock one is is actually pretty simple it was just it was an area during world war ii where they were trying to do chromium mining and so mm -hmm. they had built a little road which is what is basically the trail now and and i think it's easy you know it's it's not easy but you you get a car up a place that's really tough to get it to and it maybe is harder getting it back out and yeah. if you just abandon your mine because it's not worth it uh people leave stuff behind so we we find abandoned weird odd relics all over the place yeah if, if if anybody's ever hiked the johnston ridge trail from mutaw flat down into sespe hot springs you'll see several abandoned motorcycles because that was one of the last motorcycle routes into the sespe um in fact in 20 2014 i think uh, as a forest watch service project we spent four days in the sespe um in in conjunction with the california department of fish and wildlife back when that's what they were called, um, doing a uh, bighorn sheep count, bighorn sheep. and um, we went up to uh, we went up to Johnston Ridge to a certain point, and uh, one of the volunteers there got a photo of me doing my best uh, Daniel Larusso swan kick off yeah. of one of those. Uh, I love a that karate, photo. little karate kid, action. karate kid, little karate kid action off of this rusted out 1950s maybe uh, motorcycle. Um, there's I'll a, go look for that photo in the uh, in the archives. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff out there and there's, you know, there's so much great history out there. Yeah. Cool. Well, it, this has been a pleasure, Craig. I really appreciate you joining us. We could um, do this all day, huh? We, we could. I'm, I'm realizing just how late this is going. But, you know, we actually have had uh, most of the people that joined us are still still hanging around. So <laughs> thank you all for for joining. I would say if you have more questions Craig, is, is there a way to reach you uh, if people have additional questions? That yeah, you know what? Um, my I've been told recently that the contact link on my website has gone down or isn't clicking, but you can chat me on um, my Instagram. Um, it's it's a, what do you call it? publicly publicly accessible, viewable. It's a, it's, it's, um, a, it's a public profile, yeah. Okay, public profile, that's the word, thank you. Um, it's Craig R carry all one handle um feel free to feel free to drop me a message if you have any questions and um and, happy and, to chat and would you i mean would you suggest people go to your your website as well yeah um it, that the website isn't as updated as it once was um you know right. I, I can give you any various list of reasons and or excuses um but if you're interested it's, in some older historical um entries you can go to craigrcarry.net or i think it also forwards from craigrcarry.com um just and they're just blog posts and idle musings about trail naming conventions and historical maps and um all sorts of stuff oh okay hold i i 
<laughs> oh boy. Somebody, we got a web sleuth out here or something because you mentioned that uh, karate kid photo. And yeah. I'm a big swan it. kicker. Somebody, wow. somebody found it like immediately. So wow. hold on here. Here it is. Um, yeah. So this is the oh. one I believe. Wow. They put, okay. So Dr. Walker must be here this evening. That's his Flickr profile. And that is, Oh, I shot. see. I see. Yeah. Yes. Look at that. Yep. Um, how, what year, what year is this? This is 2014. Um, okay. 2014. Did I not Look say 2014? No, you yeah. did. You did. So, I just, um, yeah, size thinking. 13 Merrill's a pair of Patagonia G3, um, <laughs> pants. Um, my old Patagonia vote the environment, um, organic tea that I got from Los Padres forest watch. Thank you. And once again, that infamous great Pacific ironworks ball cap, man, I loved that cap. Boy, uh, that is, that is quite a photo. You should. Thank you very much. You need yeah, to I'm quite, that I'm more. quite pleased that I didn't break my neck coming off that bike. More, more limber than I was expecting. That is oh. an impressive pose. Yeah. Yeah. Was that a, was that a, was that a tree joke? Uh, um, a limber pine. Uh -huh. now, where is the, where, where's like the only place you can really find limber pines in the Los Padres? Funnily enough, uh, the same place I find Clark's Nutcrackers um, up on the top of Pinos. <laughs> Yep. There you go. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a high Any other question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> hey, do <laughs> we just need to, do we need to do a tree, a trees of the Los Padres webinar? Oh, is that dude, what we need that to do? would be my most favorite. You know what my, one of my most favorite books as a kid growing up was Sudworth's trees of the Pacific slope that ah, my dad yes. gave me when I was 12, that wow. book. Yeah. And I told you school. before That's old I was, school, Sudworth. it is yeah. old school. I was, I told you before I was the undefeated fifth grade hangman champion because my word was right. pseudo pseudo macrocarpa. Um, just we, we, okay. Just full disclosure, everyone, our favorite, both of our favorite conifers is, is the big cone Douglas fir, pseudo suga macrocarpa and, um, neither just, a fir nor a, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a big cone <laughs> Douglas fir. It's not really, a, it's not a fir. It's a, it's a Douglas fir. Um, and some people call it a big cone Douglas spruce, not a spruce. Doesn't really have that big of a cone. It's just a, it's a weird name, but it's, it all, is relative. A, it's all relative. Just but it's also time. lent its name to at least two camps in the Southern Los Padres, right? In Santa Paula Canyon, three and a half miles up when you get to Big Cone. And then um, when you... Um, um, Where's the are, other one? I don't... Oh, Big Cone, um, north slope of um, McKinley, as you're... Oh, or right. Kachuma Saddle um, coming up Manzana. Or... Is it's it? Big Cone Spruce. It's Big Cone Spruce no, uh, off the Manzana. That's what it's called. And then that super steep climb up McKinley uh, to the road, the fire. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Big Cone Spruce. So there you go. Big Cone is not a spruce. Do not, don't call it a spruce. <laughs> don't call it a Douglas Spruce. It's a Douglas fir. So remember With that. a hyphen. Yeah. With a hyphen. Yes. Uh, capital D and a hyphen. Yeah, there you go. Boy, I Love think it. we need to do a trees. Uh, I'm that just putting great. this out there for my, for my coworkers who are like, I think tired of my webinar ideas. So, um, but, uh, I want to do a trees, trees. I'm down. Padres. I'm down. We got, we got one vote for it. So that's great. Uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, thank you for your time. They, they have. Thanks everyone. Enjoyed. Super appreciate you being here. Um, and, uh, people, someone said that they've been using your first book since it first came out and awesome. Wow, and they're still here and they haven't gotten lost. Ooh, endorsement. <laughs> and they mentioned um, Billy Goats, bro. I don't know. Who that, that, would, that would be, yeah. Um, that was, that's somebody then who knows my older brother, uh, Billy, who um, He's a Billy puts goat. me to shame in terms of uh, ability, navigation skills, all things. I am just the, uh, I'm just the one who talks a lot. <laughs> my, my brother really gets the, the credit. So. Well, we were glad for you to be here talking a lot. That was what Likewise. it was for, and we had a great time. So remember, if you are uh, if you're here tonight, please go and check out the um, the website. And I'm gonna just one more time. I'm gonna put this book link. Oh no, I've lost the link. Uh, I, I have a different one that uh, that I'm copying and pasting here. Okay, here we go. Let's see here. Uh, I'm gonna put the link once again in our chat. Please go check that out. You can buy Craig's second edition of his of his awesome book about hiking and backpacking in Santa Barbara and Ventura counties, uh, focused on the Los Padres National Forest. And if you are watching uh, after this has already uh, gone live, we uh, we should have a link somewhere in the description right below this video. Uh, you you can still go and you know, purchase it anytime. And again, some of that proceed, some of those proceeds go back to helping uh, Forest Watch do our conservation work. So, thank you again, Craig. Awesome. I'm going to thanks, Brian. I'm going to end the recording, here. and then uh, we'll get the party, the after party started. So, I'm going <laughs> to end the recording now. Goodbye, all. Thank you for watching.